Thank you. Um, well, it's, it's good to be back. Uh, sorry for all of you who were here yesterday. You've heard a good chunk of what I'm going to talk about, but hopefully it's still interesting. And for the rest of you, uh, welcome. So uh, I guess Ben and I switched spots. He was a Caltech grad student, now an MIT professor, and was an MIT grad student and a Caltech professor. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's good to be back. Um, OK, so I want to talk today again about the role that RNA plays in uh, shaping nuclear organization and gene regulation. And uh, just by way of quick introduction, I mentioned yesterday that, uh, the, that mammalian genomes encode tens of thousands of long non-coding RNAs, uh, which uh, encode multi-exonic transcripts, but do not, are not translated into proteins. And these link RNAs have now been implicated in many different uh, uh, biological processes and uh, implicated in many different human diseases. Uh, for example, link RNAs have been shown to play critical roles in various different neuronal processes, and their dysregulation has been shown to be associated with various different uh, neuronal dis disorders, including in various intellectual disabilities, Parkinson's, and others. Uh, they're, they're been shown to play important roles in cardiomyocyte differentiation, including uh, from work here uh, by Lori Boyer and, and others, uh, and their dysregulation has been shown to be associated with cardiovascular diseases, as well as uh, a, a wide range of additional biological processes, from immune responses to cell cycle regulation uh, and, their, and many of their associated diseases. Now, it's perhaps not surprising that many of these different link RNAs have been associated with these different biological processes, given that many of these RNAs have been shown to play critical roles in the regulation of gene expression. And, uh, while we've started to describe many of the functional roles that different RNAs can play, certainly many more to be described, uh, what, we wanted, what my lab has been interested in understanding is the mechanisms of how uh, link RNAs can modulate gene expression. And maybe put it a different way is what makes RNA special in its regulatory capabilities uh, within the nucleus relative to, for example, proteins or even DNA, uh, cis regulatory DNA elements. And so, as I mentioned yesterday, my lab uh, for the last 10 years has been studying um, this process of X chromosome inactivation. Uh, very uh, quickly, for those of you who uh, don't know about X inactivation or who were in here yesterday, uh, female mammals uh, have two X chromosomes, males have one and a Y chromosome. The X chromosome contains many important protein coding genes. Uh, that have nothing to do with sex determination. And so this creates a dosage imbalance between males and females. And so pretty much every organism that has sex chromosomes, uh, whether they're an XY system or a ZW system, uh, can, uh, contains some mechanism to achieve dosage balance uh, between the sexes. In placental mammals, the way that this is done is through a process called X chromosome inactivation. And the reason that we're interested in X chromosome inactivation is because it's orchestrated by a single link RNA gene called EXIST. Uh, and uh, EXIST is uh, actually necessary and sufficient to induce uh, X chromosome inactivation. Uh, in fact, if you express it in male cells, you will silence uh, um, an X chromosome in males. Um, and the way that exists works is that it's very tightly developmentally regulated. It's turned on immediately upon differentiation from the inner cell mass, which is when random X inactivation initiates during development. It, uh, the RNA itself localizes broadly across the entire X chromosome and leads to the recruitment of a whole cascade of different chromatin regulatory proteins um, and ultimately triggers chromosome-wide transcriptional silencing. It's actually, that is maintained uh, epigenetically through cell divisions uh, for the duration of the lifetime of a female uh, organism. Okay, so um, I'm going to shortchange uh, many years worth of work by, by, by my lab and other labs um, by quickly summarizing what we know about how EXIST actually does this and how it actually silences transcription. And, um, and the way that EXIST can silence transcription of genes on the X chromosome is that prior to EXIST induction, uh, genes on the future inactive X chromosome are, are actively transcribed, acetylated, PAL2 uh, is, is localized and, and, and transcribing. EXIST turns on and it can localize to sites on the X chromosome uh, through a high affinity interaction with an RNA and DNA binding protein called SAFA, also known as HNRPU, uh, and can interact it can also interact with another RNA binding protein called SHARP, also known as SPEN. Um, the SHARP RNA binding protein can interact with the SMART uh, nuclear receptor co-repressor and the histone deacetylase complex HDAC3, leading to deacetylation of, of chromatin, uh, chromatin compaction, 
and Paul II eviction uh, from the chromosome, uh, triggering uh, transcriptional silencing. And downstream of this silencing event, uh, there are many other chromatin changes that occur on the inactive X chromosome that are uh, recruited either directly or even indirectly uh, by this event, and that includes recruitment of various chromatin regulators, including the polychrome repressive complex, as well as DNA methylation. And I, I um, uh, want to make sure that I, I, I point out that um, uh, in parallel to our study, Howard Chang and uh, Anton Woods, Neil Brockdorf, uh, and uh, more recently also uh, Edith Hurd uh, have shown the important, uh, the important role for this complex, including SHARP and HDAC3, uh, both in the context of X inactivation in vitro and even in mouse models and during development. Um, okay, so uh, this explains how exist can silence transcription at an individual gene, but how does exist actually do this chromosome wide? Uh, and I told you a little bit about this yesterday, uh, and this, uh, once again, is a summary of, of many years worth of work, but I'll just say that. Uh, prior to exist induction, there's a pre-existing three-dimensional topology of the X chromosome, and that when exist turns on, it can actually localize at these sites that are closest to it in three-dimensional space through, uh, dif uh, through diffusion and sequestration. That is, it, uh, the RNA diffuses locally and gets, if you will, trapped through a high affinity interaction with SAF-A that's present at these different DNA sites, and it can spread by remodeling the uh, structure of the X chromosome to uh, reposition uh, bound DNA regions to the nuclear lamina, and by doing so, uh, making uh, these green regions uh, in this illustration that are far away from the exist locus, uh, more proximal to the exist transcription locus, uh, and iterating this process until it can, can spread to uh, proximal genes across the X chromosome. Um, and of course, the silencing role here is mediated entirely by initiation of the silencing roles mediated by this sharps mite hdac 3 complex, but this remodeling of DNA architecture is important for the exist silencing complex to actually access uh, these additional sites on the X chromosome. Okay, so um, now that you're all kind of experts uh, I wanna, I, I, on, on X inactivation, I want to pose um, you know, sort of three simple, or I want to, I guess I want to remind you of three simple observations about X inactivation, right? So the first one is X chromosome inactivation entails silencing of one of the two X chromosomes, so only the inactive, not the active X chromosome. It has to silence virtually all genes across the entire X chromosome, and it needs to achieve silencing of the X, the whole X, and nothing but the X, meaning you don't, you wanna make sure that you, you restrict silencing to the inactive X chromosome and not to autosomal genes, okay? And so this mechanism of three-dimensional diffusion that I, I, I explained to you earlier and the fact that exist can form this compartment and recruit this repressive complex, this SharpSmart HDAC3 complex to the X chromosome would explain how you get silencing on one of the two X chromosomes, that is, the X chromosome that, is transcribe, that transcribes exist will be the X chromosome that silences, that, that, um, that will be silenced, okay? We're not gonna talk for the moment about how it chooses, but when it's, trans it's transcribed from one of the X's, this local three-dimensional search would enable it to silence only one of the two X chromosomes and not the other one, as opposed to if you were to think about a diffusion-based model, okay, a trans-based model. But what it doesn't explain is these other two questions, which is, how do you actually achieve uh, chromosome-wide silencing across the entire chromosome? And how do you restrict silencing so that it only occurs on, on the X chromosome and doesn't diffuse to autosomes? Okay. And so to, to maybe explain why this, this, th these, are, um, these are such challenging questions, why these questions exist given this model, um, I want to sort of rem um, remind you, for those who were here yesterday or for those of you who weren't, tell you about just some very basic numbers, okay? So uh, if we map exist across the entire chromosome uh, in an ensemble of cells, what you see is a map that looks something like this, which, which is that exist localizes virtually to every location on the X chromosome. So it doesn't localize preferentially at promoters. It doesn't localize um, uh, only at genes. It localizes over virtually the entire X chromosome. 
And the X chromosome in mouse is about, is a little bit over 167 million base pairs, and it contains more than 1,000 different genes that are silenced by exist. Okay? And so this picture, this ensemble picture, has sort of always painted this picture uh, for us and, and others in the field of a, if you will, a stoichiometric model where exist localizes at each gene on the chromosome and can silence transcription of those genes, right? So exist is everywhere. So of course, if it's present at those sites, it can recruit a repressor, it can silence transcription. But of course, this is an ensemble picture. If you think about what's actually happening in a single cell, right, this can't, this can't be the case. And the reason for that is because there are only about 60 to 200 copies of the exist RNA per cell in a single nucleus. Okay? And this is a super resolution image. You can actually see that this, this dashed line here is the X chromosome. Uh, these are the exist molecules. Right? It's, the exist RNA is actually not present in a single cell at every single site. In fact, you have, on, on average, about one copy of the exist RNA per megabase, per million base pairs of DNA, okay? And so what you have to rethink is, rather than this stoichiometric model, we have to think about a non-stoichiometric model, which is how can a single RNA molecule silence dozens of genes, right, simultaneously, even at locations where it's not physically present? Right? Because this RNA can only be present at one site, but yet has to exert its silencing role over a much, much larger genomic span and across many genes. And, and this is um, um, a question that uh, has really uh, been around for quite some time and hasn't really been easy to wrap our heads around. Uh, and this is actually, I, I would say, a broader question because one of the uh, observations going back you know, 15, 20 years for the, to, to the first discoveries of sort of pervasive transcription in mammalian genomes is actually how lowly expressed many non-coding RNA genes are. And in fact, many of the reported functional non-coding RNAs often uh, are reported to have phenotypes that vastly exceed the copy number at which they're expressed, uh, just like exist. And so how can a link RNA like exist that is expressed at such low levels exert um, uh, such dramatic effects that exceed their copy number. Uh, to borrow from Igor Ulitsky, who wrote a beautiful review on this topic, uh, how can link RNAs punch above their weight? Okay, um, okay. so uh, to start to answer this question, we considered sort of two possible models. The first one is the simple stoichiometric model, which I alluded to earlier, which is that exists, right, spreads in three-dimensional space, localizes to DNA sites, uh, and at each of the DNA sites that it localizes, it recruits this silencing complex and can turn off transcription. The other uh, model is a non-stoichiometric model where exist can localize to DNA sites, uh, once again, through this three-dimensional search, and then can recruit a, a, a non-stoichiometric uh, concentration of sharp and smart, HI3, to um, uh, increase the overall concentration of uh, this repressor uh, within, this, within this region. And so uh, we thought theoretically about what would the predictions of these two models be. And uh, what we thought is that if you look at the accumulation of exist and sharp and you track it over time upon induction of X inactivation, then in a stoichiometric model, what you would expect is that the rate at which sharp increases should be proportional, linearly proportional, to the rate at which exist increases. So as exist increases, sharp would increase as well. And, and that would be, um, that change, that rate would be flat. Uh, whereas in a non-stoichiometric model, as exist increases, you, will inc you would have more and more sharp, proportionally more and more sharp, accumulating over the inactive X chromosome, and that would look something like this, or what we refer to as the non-stoichiometric model. And in fact, we did exactly this, which is we tracked uh, exist localization and sharp localization across the inactive X chromosome at several time points across X inactivation from one hour to 72 hours. And what you can see is that early on, it does follow what would, what would appear to be a stoichiometric model, right, where exist does accumulate on the X chromosome, uh, sharp accumulates on the X chromosome proportionally to exist accumulation, but that it, it quickly transitions into a phase um, sorry, that was a poor choice of term, words here. Um, it, it quickly transitions into where, where um, uh, sharp actually accumulates at a faster rate than exist uh, accumulates on the X chromosome. 
And so to, to sort of look at this another way, uh, this, is an, an, this is an image of, of this at, at a later time point. And um, the, the blue here is DAPI, the magenta is exist, and the green is sharp. Uh, and what you can hopefully appreciate is that over the, active, the inactive X chromosome here, right, exist is present at for sort of discrete sites uh, on the chromosome. And that sharp accumulates uh, over that entire region, actually at high, and at, at even, even, where it is even present at locations that are between the individual exist molecules. Okay, so, um, okay, so this suggested that in fact, uh, the way that this may work is through a non-stoichiometric recruitment. Uh, and hopefully, I'll say this, but hopefully it was already obvious and clear from what I said before, but just to make sure that this, just to make sure, uh, recruitment of sharp to the inactive X chromosome is entirely dependent on induction of exist, right? So, so recruitment of this sharp complex is initiated by, by, initi by by exist expression. So, what, so how can this work? How can exist actually recruit this uh, non-stoichiometric uh, con uh, concentration of this repressor? So to quickly orient you and remind you, SHARP is um, a 400 kilodalton protein. It contains uh, four RNA recognition domains, which are responsible for its binding to RNA, and a Spock domain, which is responsible for its binding to SMART and HDAC3. Uh, if you delete this domain, it doesn't bind to exist. If you delete this domain, it doesn't silence transcription. Um, and, but the vast majority of the protein, about 70% of it, is predicted to be unstructured. Uh, that doesn't mean there isn't some cryptic other functional role there, but it's predicted to be unstructured. Uh, and so you know, we hypothesized, based on all of the work by many of the leaders in this room and, and others, uh, showing that proteins containing intrinsically disordered regions can undergo concentration-dependent phase separation to form uh, condensates and assemblies, that perhaps SHARP may similarly be undergoing a concentration-dependent phase transition. And so uh, to do this, the first thing we wanted to look at was just whether or not SHARP had the potential to form uh, such, uh, such condensates. And, and I guess I should actually say that this was actually first, this idea was actually first suggested to me by Richard Karaki when I gave a talk at St. Jude going back now many years ago when I first started talking about SHARP um, because they had looked at this protein and was, were telling me about all of its um, IDRs and, 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 and potential to form these condensates. Um, uh, but we, uh, instead of doing this in vitro, we actually did this um, because it was hard to purify this protein. We did this sort of, um, sort of in vitro but in cells where we uh, were able to express SHARP in a cell that doesn't have an inactive X chromosome off of a dox-inducible promoter, so we can titrate the expression of SHARP. And we wanted to ask a simple question, as we increase the concentration of the protein, does it undergo, uh, does it form assemblies? Does it undergo, uh, does it form condensates? Okay. And so um, this is just an example. Uh, no dox, you see no SHARP. Uh, you know, 0.1x, you see sort of more diffusive SHARP. And when you go all the way to 1x, you see these very clear uh, regions where you have very high intensity of SHARP. Uh, forming, suggesting that in fact, uh, uh, SHARP uh, can form condensates in a concentration dependent manner. Okay. And uh, consistent with the idea that this is, um, that this, that the ability to form these condensates is dependent on its IDRs, uh, we asked whether or not uh, the IDRs themselves are required for the formation of these assemblies. So this is um, a, a, an area colored. Uh, um, diagram of the sharp condensates in a single cell. Uh, you can see that it forms very nice foci that undergo fission and fusion uh, at various sites. If you delete the IDRs, just express this delta IDR sharp, what you see is that now it no longer forms these, it diffuses very broadly throughout the nucleus. Um, okay, so, uh, this, so, the, so this suggests that the IDR region of sharp is critically important for the formation of these these uh, assemblies, these, these condensates. The, but of course, I mentioned that about 70% of this 400 kilodalton protein is an IDR, is a predicted IDR. So this is a pretty big truncation, okay? And, and, and I also mentioned that given how big this is, right, we can't rule out the fact that there are other cryptic functional roles that are contained within this domain. So what we wanted to be able to do is, uh, ha is be able to rescue these, these assemblies 
by um, exploring whether or not the formation of these condensates was dependent on the ability of these IDRs to undergo homotypic assemblies, okay? As opposed to, for instance, a cryptic RNA binding domain or cryptic DNA binding domain or something else that we may have also uh, 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 affected. And so the way that we, we did this was to take our delta IDR construct and fuse uh, the IDR region from, that we took from the FUS protein. And the reason we took the IDR from the FUS protein is just because it's been shown by, by many other groups to be able to undergo concentration-dependent base separation both in vivo and in vitro. So we took this domain, fused it to the delta IDR uh, sharp construct, and um, expressed it once again um, across our dox titration, um, uh, and in fact, observed that it, it can rescue the ability to form these concentration-dependent assemblies, okay? So um, while I will not exclude the possibility that these sharp assemblies are forming heterotypic assemblies in, vi in vivo, the, the, uh, the fact these, these homotypic associations seem to be sufficient to actually drive uh, these, um, these events in this context. Okay, so now that we have a system that allows us to um, reconstitute these events, we, we turn to thinking about what is the actual role of these in X chromosome inactivation, okay? And so just to quickly orient you, um, I'm gonna, this is, this is sharp in green, uh, the inactive X chromosome stained here in, in magenta, uh, and these are the overlaps. If you look at the full length sharp, so this is the wild type, it has its RRMs, has its, its um, Spock domain, and has the IDRs, you can see that it accumulate, sharp accumulates uh, and enriches over the inactive X chromosome, as would be expected. If you delete the RRM domain, right, which can no longer bind to exist, uh, or the IDRs, uh, which disrupt its ability to undergo uh, concentration-dependent base separation, what you can see is that now you saw that this is the inactive X, uh, well, the, the, the X, <laughs> I should say, um, and you see that you don't actually have that enrichment of sharp, okay? And this is just a quantification over here. And finally, if we rescue this delta IDR with our FUS fusion, uh, what you can see is that we can, uh, that once again, you can get this accumulation of sharp over the inactive X chromosome, right? Okay, so uh, given that uh, these IDRs and the hom these homotypic uh, associations seem to be critical for sharp accumulation, uh, we next asked whether or not this is important for silencing of transcription on the X chromosome. Uh, and so just to, to remind you, Induction, we can induce exist expression with doxycycline in mouse yes cells, um, which is uh, actually the developmental stage at which X inactivation normally occurs. Uh, in the presence of SHARP, exist will silence transcription on the X chromosome. And in fact, in the presence of the full length SHARP, you see uh, robust silencing of genes on the X chromosome, uh, monoallelic uh, silencing. Uh, if you delete the RRM domains, once again, you can no longer bind to exist, you no longer get silencing on the X chromosome. And if you delete the IDRs, similarly affect silencing on the X chromosome. But if you rescue this delta IDR with this FUS mutant, uh, with this FUS fusion, uh, we can now uh, um, re revert uh, this effect and actually achieve silencing on the X chromosome. It isn't exactly the same, it isn't perfect, likely for the reasons we discussed yesterday around the fact that the valency of these interactions are probably not identical, but uh, nonetheless uh, a, a fairly significant uh, uh, silencing effect. So what this data suggests to us is this idea that um, RNA-mediated assemblies can drive spatial amplification of this repressor complex on the X chromosome to enable robust uh, chromosome-wide silencing. And the way that this works is that, uh, as I pointed out earlier, right, the exist RNA turns on can spread to other sites on the X chromosome by three-dimensional diffusion and sequestration to seed a high local concentration on the X chromosome. And because the sharp complex, which is otherwise diffusive through the nucleus, uh, has high affinity for exist uh, through its RRM domains that bind directly to the A repeat of exist, which is a multivalent binding site, uh, that changes the, the, the relative concentrations within the X chromosome territory versus the remainder of the nucleus. And this is a stoichiometric event, right? It, 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 it's not a one-to-one -one stoichiometric event because it's multivalent binding site, but it is a, a stoichiometric event in that it, you have direct binding between the protein and the RNA. Uh, and once you achieve high enough concentration in this 
region of the X chromosome, it can then undergo a concentration-dependent phase transition where the proteins, the sharp proteins themselves can interact with other sharp proteins through their IDRs to actually form multivalent uh, um, uh, phase-separated assemblies. And in this way, uh, sharp can accumulate in this territory uh, through these protein-protein interactions that aren't dependent on direct interactions with the exist RNA molecule. Uh, and so you, so you have two key phases. One is our, you know, a stoichiometric phase, which is dependent on the RMs, and then an amplification phase, which is dependent on the IDRs. Okay, so um, this is the part that I didn't talk about yesterday. Um, but uh, what, okay, so hopefully what I've convinced you of is that this process of IDR-dependent phase separation is critical for enabling chromosome-wide silencing on the X chromosome, uh, and that it's a way of converting, if you will, a low copy number of exist into a robust signal, right? Uh, a low copy number of exist that is sub-stoichiometric to its targets into a robust signal that can be, um, that can silence uh, its uh, more abundant targets. Uh, and that happens through this amplification mechanism. But I want to pose a slightly different question, which is, this seems like there's another way to solve this problem, which is why not just express exist at higher levels such that it can form a stoichiometric complex with each of its targets, okay? Uh, why, why go through this amplification mechanism for silencing? And um, so, okay, so to answer this question, um, we, we started thinking about what, you know, like what are the features of exist and exist spreading and silencing? And uh, to remind you, right, exist, I, I've told you, exists uh, um, seeds by spreading from its transcription locus in three-dimensional space. And so we, we hypothesized that, in, that perhaps if, if exist were expressed at higher levels, that that would actually impact its specificity on the X chromosome, okay? Uh, and uh, we took advantage of our uh, DOCS-inducible exist system. At low concentrations of DOCs, exist is expressed at low level, lower levels. At higher concentration of DOCs, we can drive it to, to increasing concentrations. Uh, and um, these are just some images at different concentrations of, of DOCs. So no DOCs, no exist. Uh, at low, you know, relatively low concentrations, you see a cloud that is roughly the size of the inactive X chromosome. At, slightly higher, at higher concentrations, you see a larger cloud. At even higher concentrations, you see an even larger cloud. And I won't show the quantification because I forgot to put it in, but it's actually pretty well correlated, the concentration of exist and the, the radius of this compartment. Okay, so um, are these, uh, is it that basically the X chromosome is just more diffuse, or is it that exist is actually spreading to autosomal regions in these different contexts? So we looked at this uh, um, using uh, RAP, which is a method that allows us to effectively, it's like chip, but we can purify it exists, we can sequence what DNA sites it's on. Uh, and you know, normally at uh, low concentrations of DOCs, which are co comparable to the expression levels, uh, it's endogenous expression levels, you can see that it's, in all, in all of these cases, it's enriched on the X chromosome. In the low concentration, you can see that it's pretty much only on the X chromosome. Um, once you get to 3X DOCs, you can see that you start to see regions on autosomes that start to pop up. Now, it look, at this zoom level, it actually looks like it's covering everything. It's not. Um, there are, in fact, uh, very specific regions that are preferentially bound. Uh, and these regions, I'm showing you here a specific region on chromosome 8 and chromosome 15, uh, actually correlate very, very nicely, actually, with regions that are closest to the, to the X chromosome in three-dimensional space uh, uh, by uh, proximity, uh, three-dimensional proximity which would make sense given the mechanism of how exist spreads, okay? And so what this suggests is that the reason exist is expressed at low levels is because if it were to be expressed at higher levels, it would actually no longer be able to achieve specificity to the X chromosome. So as in, at higher levels, it would start to spread beyond the X chromosome. Uh, so, you know, low levels of exist kind of constrain it to the X chromosome, higher levels start to spread the radius of this compartment uh, to incorporate other autosomal regions. And so if this is the case, what we um, speculated was that there has to be some mechanism that actually, that con actually controls the exist transcription level to ensure that it's actually uh, maintained within that right uh, dosage regime. 
right? Because, of course, you know, transcription's bursty, you know, some, some um, uh, cells may have expression at very high levels, some might have lower levels, and of course, this has to be specific in every cell. And so, um, so uh, that, that, yeah, so we postulated that there would have to be some mechanism that controls this expression level. And what we noticed uh, is that if we actually uh, titrate uh, DOX concentrations um, uh, across this entire range, it, while we can increase uh, the overall expression, we actually start to observe sort of a plateauing effect uh, where as we get higher and higher, we actually start to get um, you know, less and less increase in the overall expression of, of, of SHARP. And so what we thought is that perhaps SHARP was having, um, I'm sorry, EXIST was having a negative, um, that EXIST through SHARP, uh, okay, sorry, I totally missed this, missed, missed all my words here. As we titrated DOCS, we noticed that the EXIST levels start to plateau. And so we postulated that SHARP through its interaction with exist may act to regulate the expression and control the expression of exist itself, okay? And so if we delete uh, sharp, uh, what you can see is that you actually see a dramatic increase in the overall concentration of exist as you increase uh, DOCS concentrations, meaning that exist um, uh, through sharp acts to as a feedback circuit to actually silence transcription of its own uh, RNA gene, okay? So as you get, um, so at low concentrations, exist doesn't silence its production, it's producing, you can spread across the chromosome. As you start to get high enough concentrations that would spread to autosomal regions, you actually have the exist sharp complex that actually feeds back, silences the transcription of exist, and brings it back into balance. And so um, what this picture presents is really this, uh, what I think of as a, um, an integrative mechanism for how uh, spatial amplification in 3D space can balance two uh, countervailing but critical objectives, one of which is robustness of silencing across an entire chromosome and specificity of silencing within a precise compartment, okay? And so at low concentrations of EXIST, right, EXIST is produced, uh, it, can't, it, 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 can, it can localize stoichiometrically but can't really robustly silence transcription. But when it achieves high enough concentration, it can undergo this spatial amplification that allows it to silence other genes on the X chromosome. If it gets too high, uh, such that it would start to spread, then the concentration of exist at its own locus increases dramatically and therefore acts to silence transcription and production of its own RNA, thereby constraining or feeding back to actually push the system back into the steady state um, uh, concentration. Uh, that is important for specificity, okay? And, um, and sort of these two events sort of balance the sort of low concentration uh, and its ability to achieve robust silencing with its um, ability to achieve specificity on the chromosome. Okay, so um, very briefly, uh, I'm going to just, um, since many of you already heard me yesterday, I'll just say, um, why I think this idea, this, this idea of, of spatial amplification uh, via RNA is actually a, um, a more common mechanism. And, and that is uh, that many of the features that EXIST utilizes for actually doing this are based on the idea that EXIST can accumulate in 3D space based on transcription and um, um, local um, subdiffusive sequestration. Uh, and uh, uh, by doing so can act to recruit these proteins, this protein to these regions, right, in contrast to an mRNA, which of course has to be exported, translated, and re-imported into the nucleus where it has to search through the entire nuclear volume. Okay, so the fact that this RNA that's accumulating on the inactive X chromosome has high affinity, stoichiometric affinity through its RM domains and the A repeat to the Sharp complex means that it can actually guide um, these proteins to this compartment and and also act to amplify its concentration in this local territory. So a few years back, we postulated this idea that perhaps this is more general for many other link RNAs, which share these same features, right? The ability to um, accumulate in local proximity, bind to diffusible proteins, and by doing so, seed uh, organization of nuclear compartments. And um, uh, I'm gonna skip ahead, because most of you heard this, but I'll just say 
uh, this idea that the nucleus is highly organized is not, is not surprising to any of you because you already know that um, the, you know, uh, many different regulatory proteins uh, form high concentration territories within the nucleus. Uh, these include splicing factors uh, that are organized in nuclear speckles, uh, transcriptional condensates, uh, including RNA-Pol2, transcription factors, mediator, uh, and, and, and many others. Okay. And so um, we've been really interested in understanding you know, what molecules are present within these compartments, what drives their organization, and what the functions of these compartments are. And I will um, very quickly, uh, in, you know, take less than 10 minutes to talk about this part, because you've probably all mostly heard me yesterday. But um, to do this, we've been developing, uh, we've been thinking about sort of how we measure spatial organization of the nucleus and trying to integrate, if you will, sequencing-based approaches that allow us to get genome-wide pictures with microscopy approaches that allow us to get uh, multimodal measurements of uh, DNA, RNA, and proteins. Uh, and the way that we do this is through a method we call SPRITE that utilizes uh, uh, cross-linking to fix RNA, DNA, and protein interactions in C2. Uh, we break up different, we break up chromatin into, into different fragments, into complexes, and um, we use a split and pool barcoding strategy to effectively dilute uh, these chromatin complexes into a uh, 96-well plate where each well contains a distinct barcode. Molecules that are in the same complex will that are physically cross-linked will sort together, we'll get the same barcode. Molecules that are in distinct complexes will sort independently and get different barcodes. Uh, the probability of a collision in, in this scenario is one out of 96. Not great odds if you have millions of possible complexes, but we can iterate this and can catamerize these barcodes across multiple rounds. The probabilities decrease exponentially. And so after five rounds of split and pool barcoding, the probability of collisions are about 10 to the minus 10 which allows us uh, enough specificity to assign uh, molecules that interact based on their shared barcodes. Okay. So this approach allows us to accurately measure DNA-DNA interactions. Um, this is just a, a, a quick overview, Sprite versus high c across uh, distinct resolutions from whole chromosomes to A and B compartments, TADs, and loops. <clears throat> it allows us to measure RNA-DNA interactions um, this is exist on the X chromosome. In fact, specifically on the inactive X chromosome, not the active uh, U1 uh, uh, that binds globally across the entire genome and actively transcribed genes, the U1 snRNA, that is. Uh, and finally, we can measure RNA-RNA interactions. So for example, uh, looking at splicing uh, snRNAs, uh, the U1, U2, U4, U5, and U6, can observe that they enrich specifically at the individual, at individual introns of nascent prion RNAs, uh, whereas we look at translation associated factors, 18S, 28S, 5.8S, and 5S, they're depleted over introns and enriched specifically over the coding regions of um, uh, mature mRNAs. Okay, and finally, we can use this approach to reconstruct three-dimensional distances based on the different cluster sizes that we measure where molecules that are only present within larger clusters tend to be farther apart in uh, 3D space. Molecules that are in smaller clusters tend to be closer together. Um, uh, and you can see this uh, roughly uh, in this plot. Uh, if we look at small clusters, 2 to 10, the, um, as a function of genomic distance, uh, our results look very similar to high C, which, of course, is measuring molecules that are very close together. Uh, based on proximity ligation, but if we start to look at larger clusters, for example, 11 to 100, 100 to 1,000, or 1,000 plus, we start to see these longer range contacts um, that I'm not going to talk about right now. We talked about yesterday. Um, if you're interested, um, we previously published on this. Okay, and so finally, we can use these data to generate 3D models, integrating these RNA and DNA uh, data sets into structure models of the nucleus uh, this is just an example of the nucleolus of, of specific regions organized around the nucleolus, which is demarcated by the 45S uh, pre-ribosomal RNA uh, and the exist RNA. And our correlations with microscopy are quite good. Okay, so I'm actually going to skip and just um, uh, very quickly to say that. Okay, uh, in addition to exist, uh, many link RNAs also localize in three-dimensional proximity within these high concentration territories in the nucleus. Um, in fact, as a class, link RNAs are generally more enriched on chromatin uh, 
Uh, and if you look at individual examples shown here, you can see that they accumulate in the case of exist on the X, case in Q over chromosome seven, et cetera, MALT1 over the whole genome. Uh, there are exceptions, of course. Uh, for example, TOG1 and NORAD are depleted on chromatin. NORAD is known to work in the cytoplasm, and you can see it's depleted over not just its own locus, but the whole genome. Okay, uh, we can put this in sort of um, those same RNAs into this three-dimensional picture. Here, gray represents individual DNA uh, sites. These jelly beans, someone had a better analogy yesterday. Um, I forgot what it was. Uh, um, represent individual RNAs that accumulate in these locations. And if you look more globally at all these different RNAs that are, link RNAs that are expressed in the cell type, uh, what you get is a picture that looks like this, which is the vast majority of the nucleus is demarcated by one of these high concentration RNA territories. So going back to sort of the picture that I postulated about earlier, right, this idea that the nucleus may be, com may be compartmentalized by RNA, right, one prediction would be that there should exist these high concentration RNA territories that would demarcate these locations. Now, of course, this doesn't imply that all of these are acting to drive compartmentalization and organization, um, but it certainly suggests that, they have, that RNA has the potential uh, to do this in a very widespread way. But what I will show you in the, in the last uh, few minutes or so is that, in fact, RNA can play an important role in driving spatial compartmentalization in specific cases uh, and specific of these compartments that I'm showing you. Uh, one of the first examples I want to show you is around the major and minor satellite RNAs, which demarcate, which um, are enriched for heterochromatin, HP1, uh, in fact, the classic location of HP1 and heterochromatin in mammalian cells. These major and minor satellite RNAs are localized almost exclusively at Centromeric and Pericentromeric regions of DNA. Um, and in fact, uh, if you disrupt, um, if you disrupt these RNAs, um, this is a control. If we disrupt the major satellite RNA with an ASO, you can see that you decrease the overall intensity and number of these uh, uh, HP1 foci. And similarly, if we disrupt the minor satellite RNA, um, once again, you disrupt the overall intensity and number of these uh, HP1 foci. Uh, suggesting that, in fact, transcription of these satellite-derived RNAs from these centromeric regions is important for driving uh, DNA, DNA organization of these centromeric regions into these clusters, but also for uh, recruitment of, the, of HP1 uh, to these uh, chromocenters. Okay? And, um, and finally, uh, I started by telling you about SHARP, so I'll end by telling you about SHARP. So if you look at SHARP more broadly, um, beyond the inactive chromosome, what we found is that it actually forms very uh, clear clusters uh, within the nucleus. And, uh, and these are dependent on RNA. If we disrupt the RM domains of, of SHARP, uh, now rather than forming these, uh, these defined locations, uh, SHARP will diffuse across the entire nucleus. In fact, if you zoom in on one of these clusters, uh, in this case the casein q one ot one cluster, it's enriched over these specific genes. Uh, that are imprinted, meaning silenced on one of the two alleles, uh, but not over its neighboring, uh, neighboring and linear space, um, non-imprinted genes shown here in gray. Uh, in fact, casein q one t one we found binds to SHARP uh, through some biochemistry experiments. Uh, and uh, based on that, we, were just, we looked at whether or, not what these SHARP, whether or not it's important for seeding these SHARP condensates, or at least one of these SHARP condensates, uh, these two alleles represent the two genomic DNA lo loci, okay, allele one, allele two. This is the RNA, so it's only expressed on allele one, not on allele two. And if you look at this overall SHARP picture, you can see a very clear enrichment of SHARP over the allele that contains the RNA, but not over the allele that doesn't. And in fact, if you disrupt this interaction, you have a pretty, you have a, a, a dram a pretty dramatic effect on gene expression, upregulation of gene expression, specifically over the genes that are localized within this compartment. Okay, and so uh, what I want to end with is sort of this more general model, this more general idea of how we're thinking about RNA and its role in nuclear organization, and that is that uh, non-coding RNAs uh, through, the, through the process of transcription can create high local concentrations uh, in the nucleus in proximity to their transcription locus. Um, that doesn't, I'm not implying that they're nascent RNA, sorry if that's unclear, but even that they can be stabilized locally and bind locally within these regions, but that the process of transcription creates a high local concentration through a source, um, a production source, 
that these high local concentrations can uh, bind to, of RNA can bind to uh, various different diffusible molecules, including various different proteins and also diffusible non-coding RNAs like SNO RNAs, uh, SNR, um, sNRNAs, uh, tRNAs, et cetera, in different contexts. Uh, and by doing so, can drive overall recruitment of these uh, diffusible molecules into these spatial compartments and even can amplify their overall concentrations uh, by driving concentration-dependent phase separation um, uh, in specific cases. Okay, so uh, with that, I will end. Um, I want to make be sure to uh, acknowledge Sophie, who was a former graduate student in the lab who um, developed Sprite, uh, started as a rotation project, really uh, thought through uh, and really did some really beautiful, beautiful work with it. Um, Joanna uh, um, is now a former postdoc in the lab, literally left last week to start her own lab. Uh, and Mackenzie, a graduate student in the lab who co-led the X chromosome work I told you about, both really wonderful people. If you're looking for a postdoc, talk, look at Joanna's uh, lab uh, and the rest of my lab and the people who give us money. So uh, thank you. I had three quick questions. So in the in, on the inactive X, is H3K27 trimethylation located across the whole chromosome? Yes. That's how you get silencing. Well, that's not how you get silencing. Uh, actually, uh, K27 trimethylation is dispensable for silencing, but you do have H3K27 trimethylation that coats the X chromosome. It's sort of a downstream secondary effect. In the experiments where you deleted the sharp IDR, what happens if you delete the Spock domain? Yeah, uh, so if we delete the Spock domain in addition to the IDR or just independently? Independently. Yeah, so if you delete the Spock domain, you don't get silencing because you don't get recruitment of smart HDAC3. Ah, I didn't okay. show it here, but yeah. this has been, sh we've, we've shown it before, Edith has shown it before, this has been, yeah, well characterized. And the last thing was the, the FUS IDR relocalization or, or complementation. So in other RNA binding proteins, the low complexity IDRs generally don't interact kind of willy-nilly. Right. <laughs> right, so in that complementation experiment, you must also be recruiting other things that the FUS IDR normally interacts yeah. with, but still it's functioning. Yeah, um, perhaps. Um, we have obviously haven't sort of explored the full molecular components that are contained within that. Um, but what we do expect is that it will recruit other you know, FUS IDRs that are on the sharp uh, uh, protein. And, you know, the sharp protein should be enriched on the inactive X chromosome because it's recruited there by its um, binding to exist. So there may very well be other things that also get trapped in there that shouldn't be there, but, um, um, so, yeah. Nice sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and we're, not, what we're, we're not looking here for it to be replaceable. Right, what we're really just trying to do is create homotypic association. So what we're looking for here, in, in fact, this, this rescue is in a knockout line. So we knock out the endogenous. Right? So what we're looking for is actually whether it can interact with itself, with the rescue construct. Right? Hey, Mitch. Um, <clears throat> how do you think about the problem that the nucleus has of efficiently transporting spliced mRNA out of the nucleus and away from the locus where it's being transcribed versus oh. <laughs> all these beautiful non-coding yeah. RNAs that are... Um, oof, okay, yeah, no, that's a great question, and I have lots of thoughts on this one, actually. Um, I'll do the simple version, but I'm happy to talk more about this uh, later. Um, but I think that, generally speaking, right, fully spliced mRNA is generally diffusible, and so they're bound to various transport factors, and can be trafficked. So I think that a, you know, a lot of the sequestration, if you will, happens through sort of an active localization. So for example, in the case of EXIST, it's not that it's not engaged by transport factors ever. There's an active binding event on chromatin that, with SAF-A that actually retains it at high affinity. Right? So presumably, if an mRNA doesn't have, when it's spliced, doesn't have something actively anchoring it, it will engage and diffuse. It's, that's oversimplification for sure, but 
up. I can see that. It, related to that, you have an enormous concentration of exosomes there uh, at regulatory regions degrading RNA. So how are the long non-coding RNAs excluded from that kind of regulation? Well, I mean, I'm sure that many RNAs, firstly, many RNAs, including non-coding RNAs, are degraded by exosomes. I think Nick Proudfoot has shown this for you know, many of these different eRNAs and other, uh, other types of link RNAs that can be very rapidly turned over. I think there's a range of stabilities. You know, some RNAs like MALLET1 have, sort of, if you will, decoy mechanisms with you know, funny three prime ends that protect it from degradation, make it very stable. Um, you know, I don't know uh, if it you know, exists specifically, has some, I mean, it's polydentylated, but um, I don't know if, if it specifically has a way of, de of, of avoiding exosomal degradation, but it certainly um, you know, has comparable stability to an mRNA. Um, so yeah, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I think there's probably a range of, of stabilities uh, associated with these. Beautiful work. I'm wondering whether the new thinking that you present here about three-dimensional spreading can explain some of the old data where you have ex-autosome fusions. I don't know what, what the current thinking is there. Is it still believed that it doesn't spread entirely into the autosomal part? Or is that because the cell lines selected for study kind of like yeah, so, don't do um, that? So, so I don't know. Um, all of the exoautosome spreading things because a lot of those were sort of coarse grained. But um, uh, definitely uh, you will spread into autosomes if you're expressed there. And a lot of the, con you know, the, if you will, barriers on spreading actually have to do with concentration. So it's longer chromosomes that actually tend to be the ones that are more poorly covered. The shorter chromosomes tend to actually be the ones that are more easily covered. Mm. Um, and, and this has also been true in, done in mouse where people have moved exist to different chromosomes. Uh, you see similar kinds of effects. So uh, I, so the simple answer is I do think that's the case. I think this would explain a lot of those old observations. Okay. Any more questions? Well, I actually have a question. So I think yesterday you were showing that uh, uh, you, you, you did provision of a suppressing the transcription and you see a change of RNA DNA contact, especially for nucleolus. Uh, I guess have, have you looked at similar thing for, for speckles? I guess I'm wondering, how, does the, some of the contact between chromatin and speckles like, are preserved after you suppress the transcription? Yeah, uh, great question. I too am very curious about that question. Um, we have not done a good job there, so I want to be cautious about what I say. And the reason I say we haven't done a good job there is because in our actinomycin treatments, we actually generally don't get um, you know, very strong degradation of, of nascent pre-mRNAs. So there are some that are affected, but globally, you know, we still have quite a lot of retention as opposed to for some of our Paul one or uh, other classes of RNA. So I, I don't, so I, I, I can't fully conclude the answer to that question, so I don't really want to publicly speculate, but I'd be happy to talk about it privately. All right, cool. All right, well, if you have no more questions, then maybe thank Mitch for a uh, great talk.